And thank you for the choral, for the new members and the old members of the choral, thank you. And also, June, thank you for leading the choral for all these years. And I would also like to thank the channel singers for, for that wonderful song. How many of you here would like to be happy all the time or prefer to be sad or depressed? This comes to my topic this morning, which is entitled, The Source of Happiness. This topic is a review for some of us, but we need to review once in a while what we've learned in the past. Since human nature, we tend to forget. That is why there is a word in the Ten Commandments which say, remember. Every normal human being is in search of happiness. People live, work, eat, sleep, and engage in various activities for the sole purpose of finding happiness. People come to church like this in search of happiness. People go to movies in search of happiness. People pray in order to obtain happiness. People go to disco or other entertainment places in search of happiness. What is the real definition of happiness? Well, Webster Dictionary defines happiness as good fortune, prosperity, a state of well-being and contentment, joy, a pleasurable or satisfying experience. It is derived from the word bahagya, or happiness, which means a condition in which a person feels peaceful, free from all the sorrows. So everyone longs for this kind of happiness and peace in life, free from all the pains of life. Is anyone present here who does not want to be happy? No one. Yes, everyone is in search of happiness. However, many are confused about the difference between happiness and simply having a fun time. So what is the difference between happiness and having a fun time? Having a fun time is a good, is a good feeling that takes place when someone performs an activity. However, after the activity is over, the fun time is also over. It differs from happiness, in which the happy and peaceful feeling remains even though the activity is past. Take for instance, when a person enjoys dancing or watching video, this person feels happy when the dancing is going on or when the video watching is occupying his time. But as soon as these feelings, these things come to an end, then the feeling of having time is over. This morning, as we study the Word of God, His Word in you will make you happy. Thus, even after you have left this place, real happiness can, can continue to be yours. This is what is defined as true happiness. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us this, this opportunity to study your Word. We ask your presence to be with us and your Holy Spirit to give us understanding of your word. Use me today in Jesus' name. Amen. The question we need to ask ourselves, what is the source of our happiness? I am very pleased to tell you that the Bible is the source of happiness. The Bible is the source of your personal happiness. The Bible is the source of happiness for your family. The Bible is the source of happiness for our community. A few years ago, a revival meeting of Dr. Billy Graham was held in Toronto, Canada, and he presented the following statistics. For those living in North America, there is one divorce in every two marriages if the family does not read the Bible, pray, and attend church. However, for those who do read the Bible and pray together, there is only one divorce in every 100 marriages. So how can this be explained? There must be something in the Bible that causes true happiness in the family. So if you feel, if you face problems within your family, let me recommend to you the Bible as your guidebook. But if you are already happy and wish to continue being happy, then take the Bible as your constant guidebook. Now, <clears throat> what does the Bible say about itself? 
This can be found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, and 17. What does the Bible say about itself? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 from New King James Version. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thus, the Bible is useful in bringing happiness to our lives. And the more we read the Bible, the more happiness we receive. Then we ask this question. How can we know, however, that the Bible has its origin in God? I listed six proof or evidences that the Bible is the source of happiness and derives its origin from God. Number one, the Bible existed long before science. One unique feature of the Bible that proves it is the source of our happiness, having its origin in God, is that it existed long before the discovery of science. Take, for example, the question, what is the form or shape of this world according to science? Is it a round world or a flat world? Of course, we know it is a round world. But when did man discover that the world is round in shape? History reveals to us that it was Christopher Columbus who stated that the world is round after he discovered the continent of America back in 1492. Now, what did the Bible say about the shape of the world long before Columbus discovered it? We can read this in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 22. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, and it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. The Bible says that the earth is circled, and this was written back in the year 630 B.C., approximately 2,000 years before Columbus discovered America. This fact proves that the Bible, our guidebook for happiness, is truly derived from God. Now let's look at another example of how the Bible states things way before science discovers it, which is found in Proverbs 17.22, which was our scripture reading this morning. Proverbs chapter 17, verses, verse 22. It says, A merry heart does good like medicine, or a happy heart does good like medicine. A few years ago, a person named Norman Cousins, the author of the book entitled Anatomy of Illness, who was once the chairman of cultural exchange between the former Soviet Union and the United States of America. In his book, he strongly emphasized the importance of cheerfulness on our health. He mentioned spe spe specifically his personal experience of how he suffered from a serious collagen disease in which there was widespread inflammatory changes in the collagen, the body's connective tissue. The skin of his hands became thick, inelastic, tight, smooth, and shiny. This caused great difficulty in moving his fingers. He also had difficulty in moving his limbs or extremities and even in turning over in bed. There were lumps or nodules all over the body indicating the systemic nature of this disease. His jaw could not be opened due to the connective tissue that became inflamed. It was almost luck. Experts from the Howard Rusk Rehabilitation Clinic in New York City were called. After they examined him, they too confirmed that he had collagen disease and ankylosing spondylitis, which means that the connective tissue in the spine was also disintegrated. Doctors prescribed many medications, aspirin, narcotics, sleeping medications, and others. In fact, he was taking 26 medications every day to control the pain and the stiffness. Statistics show that only one out of 500 will recover from this disease, and it is usually fatal within four to 20 years. Norman Cousins felt awfully miserable due to his pain, and one day he confided to his doctor, I am really tired of all of these medications plus the side effects of them. I really want to quit and try to make myself happy, he said. So he decided to call Alan Funt, producer of 
the TV program and ask him to send some amusing movies along with a projector to watch. Then he called the nurses and asked them, why don't you show me some of these amusing movies? Surprisingly, he discovered when he laughed, his pain was gone. He noticed that for every 10 minutes of genuine belly laughter, he would have at least two hours of pain-free sleep. Then when the pain-killing effects of the laughter wore off, he would switch the motion projector on again, and it would le lead him to another pain-free sleep interval. Sometimes the nurses would read to him from a valuable collection of humorous books. Normally, Norman really enjoyed these humorous book, movies, and stories. In fact, he was too loud that it bothered other patients. They had to move to another place. However, his sedimentation rate, the blood test which shows the severity of the inflammation, was constantly monitored. It went from 112 millimeter per hour down to 15 millimeter per hour, and at the end of eight days, he was able to move his thumb without pain. Then the gravel-like lumps or nodule on his neck and back began to shrink. He recovered sufficiently that he was able to go back to his old job. Year by year, he was able to improve his mobility till he could, till he could play tennis, play golf, ride a horse, hold a camera with a steady hand, and play piano. Research at UCLA or University of California made a study and revealed that every time a, a person was happy and laughed genuinely, it stimulated the production of a certain chemical called endorphins. And this endorphins is a natural chemical in our body that can reduce pain and inflammation. So laughter can reduce this pain. Furthermore, Endorphin can increase the activity of a certain cells in the body called the natural killer cells. What it does is to kill any tumor cells in the body by 42%. That means it helps kill any tumor or cancer cells with people who have cancer. And if person is happy all the time, he would, live, he would live a little longer and even able to get rid of the tumor or cancer. Medical science also discovered that when a person is happy, the other cells are also being activated, the T cells, which also activates another cells called macrophages. And these macrophages are essential in immune defense against many germs, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. So how true are the words in the Bible? A merry heart or a happy heart does good like medicine, resulting in a better T cells that can activate the macrophages to kill, to kill any bacteria, virus, or parasite that come into the cells of the body. Thus, a person becomes healthier. This is another proof that the Bible, as the source of happiness, was written way in advance of the field of psychoneuroimmunology, a field that links our mind and body developed only about 25 years ago. Number two, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Another unique feature of the Bible as the source of our happiness, having its origin in God, is the fulfillment of prophecy. Take, for example, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Daniel ch chapter 12, verse 4, it says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Do you believe man's knowledge has increased? Take, for example, the many types of transportations we have. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, the men used to walk and run, then go horseback riding, then travel by horse, by wagon, followed by bicycle, motorcycle, automobiles, airplane, and jet planes, so we can travel cross continent in a few hours. Look at our modern technology of communications. People used to communicate through letters, telex, telegram, then cable and faxes, and now email, Facebook, Facebook, and other social medias, sending and receiving letters via satellite. You can send any mail around the world and be received in a few seconds. Amazing way of communication. Why? Because it has been postulated, prophesied, that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. I have some military veterans who were, who were retired engineers and scientists and two were involved in the making of the cruise missiles 
and two were involved in the making of the phalanx guns. And these guns are mounted in a ships or an aircraft carrier. I was told that these are the last defense from any enemies, can be aircraft or missiles. What, what it is, it's like an old machine gun with six barrels, two, six holes in a circle. And the bullets are made of titanium, so it is heavy, so it will not sway even with a strong wind. The bullets can go up to five miles, and it has its own radar. When it fires, it goes in circle, and it fires, guess this, 3,000 rounds a minute, meaning 3,000 bullets in one minute. He said that anything that it hits, it will be pulverized. I asked how come it was not used during Iraqi war. He said it was not tried in dry lands since it was made exclusively for the ships. But he said, a few years from now, he said that our conventional machines will become obsolete with the development of laser. He said that currently this nation is developing a laser gun and it will be mounted in a satellite way placed above the sky. So in example, if missile will be fired from like North Korea, this laser would be activated and above the orbit and it will hit the missile to be destroyed. Well, it is still in the research stage, but it is possible to attain this kind of weapons. In fact, I just had a patient who, who was a driver of an M1 tank, Tanki Digira. This is the most powerful tank in the world, he said, that it can hit anything, even moving object. It already uses a laser. Before firing, it has to send a laser to the object it planned to target. That laser would bounce back to the tank and the computer would lock the object and would calculate the object. So even the object would start moving around as long as it can be seen by the scope, it can be hit. And this only, the process only takes few seconds. In the olden times during World War II, you aim at the object of the target and you fire and most of the time it would miss then you have to adjust again until you hit the target. But this particular tank, it locks on the target and you have no escape. The only escape is that if you're able to hide, but still there is a big chance it can be hit. That was the reason of the success they had during the Iraq war. A lot of Iraqi tanks were destroyed. They had no chance to fight back. By the time they were seen, they got hit. This has been prophesied that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. Number three, the harmony of the Bible writers. Another unique feature of the Bible as the source of our happiness, having its origin in God, is the harmony of Bible writers. Notice the harmony of the various Bible writers. There are approximately 40 writers in the Bible and they're various with their various life backgrounds. For instance, there is a candidate for Pharaoh called Moses, a shepherd like Amos, a fisherman like Peter, a, phys a physician like Luke, a prime minister like Daniel, a king like David, written over a period of 1,500 years. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, was written in approximately 1445 BC, whereas the last book of the Bible, Revelation, was written during the year 98 AD. Imagine being 1,500 years apart and yet the content of the Bible does not clash. There are 66 books in the Bible. The first 39 books in the Old Testament written before Christ came to earth and the last 27 books in the New Testament covering the period of Jesus' time and the life after Christ. Imagine it being written by 40 writers over 15 years period, and yet the contents do not clash. In fact, they support one another. If we were to write a book now this year and, and take 1,500 years to compile it, don't you think there is a possibility that, that the contents might clash with one another? Definitely yes, but not so with the Bible. The contents of the Bible written by 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years does not conflict. In fact, each book supports the other and provides hope for the salvation of men. This goes to say that the source should be one. Who is the source? We can find this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible was not written according to the will of man, but according to the will of God. Whether by a prophet or an apostle, their thoughts were guided by the Holy Spirit while written in their own words. No wonder every part of the Bible harmonizes with each other. Number four, the Bible can change a person's life. Another unique thing about the Bible as the source of our happiness derived from God is the change it makes in a person's life. You may hear these stories, but let me relate to you again. One day, a captain of the boat from England visited one of the islands of the Pacific Ocean. This island was famous as a cannibal island in which the people still eat human beings. This captain saw an old man who was reading a Bible, and so he asked him, what are you reading? The man replied, I'm, I'm reading God's book by which he meant the Bible. The captain laughed mockingly and said, in my country, we no longer believe that this book de derives from God. The old man responded with a shocking look and inquired further, before this book came to this island, we usually ate human beings, flesh like yours. But as soon as the Bible came to this island, we became good people. Which would you prefer, he asked the captain, for me to throw the Bible away and kill you and eat your flesh or keep on holding on to this Bible and allow you to live? Yes, the Bible can change many lives. There is power in the Bible that can change a person. That is why this is the source of happiness. Another story that happened in China, Mr. Gu, a non-Christian man who lived in China had an interesting experience. His Christian friend continued to invite Mr. Gu to come and visit his church. Well, Mr. Gu refused to come. One day, Mr. Gu invited this Christian man to accompany him to the theater. After much thought, this Christian man, this Christian young man said, okay, I will accompany, accompany you to the theater, but tomorrow you must accompany me to the church. As Mr. Gu thought this over, it seemed like a pretty good deal rather than going to the theater by himself. So off they both went to the theater. The next day, reluctantly, he went to the church with his Christian friend. This was his, the first time Mr. Gu ever attended a church, so he sat on the last row of pews. Mr. Gu thought as soon as the church service was over, he would slip out and go home. However, the pastor announced, all the guests are requested to stay behind because we have a special gift for you. Knowing that there was a gift available, so he decided to stay. After the other members had gone home, the pastor came over to Mr. Gu and handed him a gift. On the way home, he took the wrapper of the gift, and to his disappointment, he discovered that the gift was a Bible. He was about to throw it away when he flipped through its pages and realized that the paper it was made of was very thin and nice good paper to wrap his tobacco. He happened to be a very heavy smoker. So the next time he had no money left to buy cigarettes, he tore out the first page of the book of Matthew until the whole book of Matthew turned into ashes. Not long after that, the book of Mark had the same predicament, gone a heap of ashes. As he reached for the book of Luke, he thought to himself, why don't I do two things at the same time? Read it first, and then put the tobacco on the thin paper, rub it up, and smoke it. So he began reading, but he could not understand what he read, and immediately used the paper to wrap up his tobacco and smoke it until the whole book of Luke became ashes. But he tried reading it again, this time reading the book of John, the first, second, and third chapters, and on. He was so shocked about what he read that he read it over and over again, well, you guess it, it was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As a Chinese, he realized that in China, the only son is useful, usually very valuable. During the war, the only son in the family could be exempted from military responsibility. 
So he thought God has only one son, yet he offered him. But if this was his only son, it would be the same as giving himself. If such is God's love, I should be loving him in return. So from then on, he did not tear up his Bible anymore. He read all through each book till he came to the last book, the last book of Revelation. Then he thought of those books that he had smoked away. He wanted to read, read them, so he had no choice but to go back to the church again in order to receive another gift. And that was what exactly he did. He went to the church and received the gift Bible again. He continued to go to the church, and, and during the Communist Revolution in China, he evacuated to Taiwan, and there he met an Adventist pastor. Later, he was baptized and joined the Seventh-day Adventist. So we see a changed person. What caused this change? Reading the Bible can cause a person to change. If you long for a new life, you need to read the Bible, for this is the only book that can make a person good. The discouraged and hopeless person can be changed into a, a person of hope. The Bible can change hatred to love and cause enemies to be at peace. No wonder the Bible is the best guidebook for our lives. The Bible tells us about the love of God and how He cares for us. He is always thinking of our happiness. Number five, the Bible is imperishable, meaning it cannot be destroyed. Let's take another look at the uniqueness of the Bible as the source of our happiness derived from God. This lies in the fact that the Bible is imperishable. We can find this in 1 Peter chapter 1, 24 and 25. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. And it says, Because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flowers falls away but the word of the Lord endures forever. Human beings are born into this world. They grow bigger, they grow older, and they die. But the word of the Lord is imperishable. In the history of mankind, many have tried to destroy the Bible, especially during the French Revolution, when the Bible were gathered and burned, and the fire keeps on burning for weeks. But was the Bible able to be destroyed? No. The Bible was not destroyed. God preserved it. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the Bible has now been translated into over 1,027 languages. It is the most wonderful book the world has ever seen. It is estimated that there are over 200 million Bibles being produced. Placed in end to end, they would make a line of 17,000 miles long. Yes, the Bible is imperishable because this has been prophesied before. In Matthew 24, 35, Matthew 24, 25, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Number six, the last one. The Bible is constant in its content. Think of another unique fact about the Bible as the source of our happiness, as derived from God. It is the fact that the content of the Bible remains unchanged. Many people think that the Bible, since the Bible is 2,000 years old, for sure the contents are no longer original. A story once told back in on 1947, a shepherd in Kerbet Qumran, a place near the Dead Sea, was once shepherding his sheep. He discovered that he had lost one of his sheep. As he searched for his lost sheep, he went into a cave. He wanted to go inside the cave, but was quite frightened. So he took a stone and threw it inside the cave, and suddenly he heard a cream, a sound, a noise coming out from the cave. He became more frightened. So he went back home and called his cousin, and both of them went inside the cave using a torch. There they found an ancient scrolls and a broken vessel that was apparently destroyed by the stone that he had thrown inside the cave. They brought out all the scrolls from the cave and sold them to a man. This man sold them to another man, and at last they fell into the hands of Professor Albright, an archaeologist. In his observation, he discovered that the, that the scrolls were the Old Testament of the, of the Bible, which was written around 200 BC. There were several of Moses' books and Habakkuk, but the most complete book was the book of Isaiah. And they compared the book 
of Isa and the present book of Isa in the Bible. They discovered that even though 2,000 years had passed, the content was still the same. This show that what is said in the Bible is the truth. Certainly, the word of God endures forever. The Bible is God's gift to all of us. He longs for each of us to have a better life. Therefore, he has given us the best source of life, our source of happiness in the Bible. William Lyon Phelps of Yale University, who was once called the most beloved professor in America more than once, and he said, I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women, but I believe that a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. Yes, in this precious book of the Bible are guidelines for your true happiness. Brethren, we live in this world full of sorrows, but with Jesus in our lives and the reading of the Bible, it gives us hope and happiness for the years to come until Jesus comes. This is my prayer. Two hundred eighty seven. 